I was talking to somebody recently, and they said, well, I'm going through a situation, and I guess there's nothing else left to do except pray. And I hear people say that a lot. But one of the things we learn in the Bible is that prayer shouldn't be the last thing that we do. Prayer should be the first thing that we should do. Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you. Matthew 6.33 And in yesterday's reading in 2 Samuel 21, David waits a long time before he prays about the famine in Israel. In the first year there was a famine and he probably figured, well, it's a down year for the weather, down year for the economy, it'll come back. Second year, there was still famine in the land and, that, and that's when he was thinking, well, there, this is an unusual problem. And then the third year of a famine, he's like, oh boy, I better go to the Lord about it. And now in chapter 22, he's looking back over his life and he's realizing that when he remembered to pray, God delivered him. That you wouldn't, shouldn't wait until the last resort to pray to God. You should pray to him as your first resort. Let's pick up the action. 2 Samuel chapter 22. This is actually a psalm of praise as David looks back over the victories and deliverances the Lord gave him. And it's written very similarly to Psalm 18. Robert Bergen says the differences between this and Psalm 18 can be accounted by their different functions. Psalm 18 was meant for hymnic use in the public congregation and 2 Samuel 22 is intended to reveal the religious core of Israel's most revered king. Ronald Youngblood says it's recognized as one of the oldest poems of the Old Testament, going back 3,000 years to the 10th century BC. If this is so, then this is a, rest a, a restatement of the central theme of the Torah, Obedience to the Lord results in life and blessing. So this is like a theological commentary on the life of David. Let's pick it up. David sang to the Lord the words of this song, when the Lord delivered him from the hand of all his enemies and from the hand of Saul. And think about all the things that David was delivered from. David Guzik says God delivered David from Goliath, he delivered him from Saul. He delivered him from backsliding. He delivered him from Israel's enemies. He delivered David from Absalom. And he de delivered him from his own sinful passions. And looking back over God's greatest hits in his life, he said in verse 2, The Lord is my rock, my fortress, my deliverer. You know, rock and fortress are defensive strongholds in military speak. And David is speaking of God as protector. And of course he mentions him as deliverer. We've already mentioned all the things he delivered David from. My God is my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield. All defensive weapons so far, but now look at this at the end of verse 3. And the horn of my salvation, speaking of bull's horns, so that's an offensive weapon of protection for David. David says about God, he is my stronghold, my refuge, my savior. Look at all the personal pronouns. My rock, my fortress, my deliverer, verse 2. And then in verse 3, my God, my shield, my salvation, my stronghold, my refuge. David is personalizing this. Yes, God is the Savior and Deliverer of all who trust in Him, but I can speak from personal experience that God has delivered me personally. And I'm praising Him for it in the presence of the whole world. Verse 4, I called to the Lord who is worthy of praise and have been saved from my enemies. You see, we should call on him as a first resort. The devil wants you to think, oh, you don't need to call about God, on God. You'll get over it. You'll be all right. You don't need to bug him for this. And David is saying what I've learned is that I experience deliverance when I call on the Lord. 
I have experienced that it's better not to put off calling on the Lord. Verse 5, he gets all metaphorical and nautical. The waves of death swirled about me. The torrents of destruction overwhelm me. You know, the Mediterranean Sea was a great mystery to the Israelites. They would get timber that was shipped down the sea from Tyree. And sometimes there were accidents on the sea and they didn't always understand it. And so David speaks of the waves of death swirling around him. The torrents of destruction overwhelmed me. The cords of the grave coiled around me. The snares of death confronted me. In my distress, I call on the Lord. You know, we can call on the Lord before we're in distress. To have a proper relationship with God, we should be calling on the Lord every day. But David is speaking of these times of distress when he needed to be delivered. From his temple, he heard my voice. My cry came to his ears. God hears everything. Verse 8, the earth trembled and quaked. Think about that. In response to our prayers, God can make the earth quake. God cares about what we're going through. The foundations of the heavens shook. They trembled because he was angry. Angry at how people were treating God's anointed king, David. Looking back, angry at Absalom. Remember, the Lord had purposed that disaster would come upon Absalom. Smoke rose from his nostrils, consuming fire came from his mouth. Burning coals blazed out of it. He parted the heavens and came down. This is a coming of God in judgment on David and Israel's enemies. He mounted the cherubim and flew. He soared on the wings of the wind. What a majestic image of God who delivers his people. He made darkness his canopy around him, the dark rain clouds of the sky. Out of the brightness of his presence, bolts of lightning flashed forth. Even the elements of the weather are subject to God. Verse 14, the Lord thundered from heaven. The voice of the Most High resounded. He shot his arrows and scattered the enemy. This is metaphorical language of overcoming the enemies of God's people. With great bolts of lightning, he routed them. The valleys of the sea were exposed and the foundations of the earth laid bare. At the rebuke of the Lord, at the blast of breath from his nostrils, he reached down from on high and he took hold of me. He drew me out of deep waters. You remember Jesus reaching out and lifting Peter up out of the water? He did that literally. And David is saying, God did it for me metaphorically. Verse 18, he rescued me from my powerful enemy, from my foes who were too strong for me. I think one of the things that should make us call on the Lord is the realization that sometimes the situation is too much for us. The enemies are too strong for us. We need God as our strong tower. We need God as our deliverer. Verse 19, they confronted me in the day of my disaster, but the Lord was my support. He brought me out into a spacious place he rescued me because he delighted in me. And then interesting, verse 21, The Lord has dealt with me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanness of my hands. He has rewarded me. What do you mean, David? Does David have clean hands? Verse 22, For I have kept the ways of the Lord. I am not guilty of turning from my God. Well, what do you mean you turn from God when you committed adultery with Bathsheba and had her husband killed. Verse 23, all his laws are before me. I have not turned away from his decrees. What do you mean? You turned away from his decrees. Verse 24, I have been blameless before him. Really? And have kept myself from sin. And then in verse 25, he repeats it. The Lord has rewarded me according to my righteousness, 
my righteousness, David, according to my cleanness, cleanness in his sight. What's going on here? Some scholars suggest that David must have written this early in his kingship before he committed those sins, because there's no way he could say it now as an old man. But remember what Nathan the prophet said to David in 2 Samuel 12, verse 13. He said, the Lord has taken away your sin. You are not going to die. Psalm 51, verse 1. Wash away my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Psalm 32, verse 1. Blessed is the man whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord will never count against him, and in whose spirit is no deceit. David can pray these things because he's been forgiven. He's had his sins washed away. He's been cleansed. By the grace of God, by the washing of God over his life. So his righteousness is actually God's righteousness over him. Now verse 26 of 2 Samuel 22. To the faithful you show yourself faithful. To the blameless you show yourself blameless. To the pure you show yourself pure. Okay. But to the devious, you show yourself shrewd. And in Hebrew, it's literally to the crooked, you show yourself tortuous or twisted. And that doesn't sound like an image of God that, you know, we don't think of God as tortuous and twisted. But I think the Hebrew expression refers to the fact that God is even more shrewd than the tortured than the tortured twistness of his enemies. I don't know if I quite said that right, but hopefully you get the idea that God is more clever and shrewd than their most twisted twistiness. <laughs> and the NIV translates it as such. To the crooked you have shown yourself shrewd. Verse 28, you save the humble. But your eyes are on the haughty to bring them low. Now what does it mean to be humble? Does that mean going around saying, I'm a worm, I'm a weasel, I'm a nudge. I'm a worm, I'm a weasel, I'm a nudge. No. Being humble means not bragging about yourself. It really means not hardly thinking of yourself at all. You know, Romans 12, 3 says, don't think of yourself more highly than you ought but think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the measure of grace that God has given you. You think of yourself as somebody who's been forgiven, somebody who's being given a second chance to live for God in this world. And beyond that, you don't think of yourself at all. You're thinking about how to serve God and others. That's what it means to be humble. Verse 29, you Lord are my lamp. The Lord turns my darkness into light. You read the word of God and it lights the way for us to live for him. Verse 30, with your help I can advance against a troop. With my God I can scale a wall. Reminds me of Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Nehemiah 8 verse 10, the joy of the Lord will give you strength. Then 2 Samuel 22, verse 31, As for God, his way is perfect. The Lord's word is flawless. He shields all who take refuge in him. It doesn't just say he shields all, but he shields those who take refuge in him, who don't wait three years to pray before they take refuge in him. He particularly shields those who choose to take refuge in him at that time. Verse 32, for who is God besides the Lord? Well, nobody. And who is the rock except our God? Verse 33, this is an allusion to Habakkuk 319. It is God who arms me with strength and keeps my way secure. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to stand on the heights. You know, you think about deer. How do they keep their footing? as they run through the thicket 
and as they run through the woods, and yet they're able to do that. And God will make our feet that way spiritually. He'll give us stability and steadiness in an unstable world. Verse 35, he trains my hands for battle. My arms can bend a bow of bronze. God prepares us for whatever it is we're facing. That's what that means. Verse 36, you make your saving help my shield. Your help has made me great. Verse 37, you provide a broad path for my feet so that my ankles do not give way. God will make a way when there seems to be no way. Verse 38, I pursued my enemies and crushed them. I did not turn back till they were destroyed. I crushed them completely and they could not rise. They fell beneath my feet. And then look at all the second person pronouns. You armed me with strength for battle. You humbled my adversaries before me. You made my enemies turn their backs in flight. And I destroyed their foes. We got to give all the credit to God, all the praise to the Lord. I think about Oral Hershiser as he was about to be named most valuable player of the 1988 World Series. And at the end of the World Series in the dugout, people could see him lip syncing a song. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him all creatures here below. Praise him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And David's given all the praise to God. Verse 38, I pursued my enemies and crushed them. I didn't turn back till they were destroyed. I crushed them completely. They could not rise. They fell beneath my feet. But then again, you armed me with strength. You humbled my adversaries. You made my enemies turn their backs. And I destroyed their foes. Verse 42, they cried for help. But there was no one to save them. Verse 43, I beat them as fine as the dust of the earth. I pounded and trampled them like mud in the streets. David is looking back on some of the wars he fought where God was with him. Verse 44, you have delivered me from the attacks of the peoples. You have preserved me as head of the nations. People I didn't know now serve me. Thinking about the Edomites, thinking about the Ammonites and the Aramites. Foreigners cower before me. As soon as they hear of me, they obey me. This reminds me of 2 Samuel 6, the Lord, or I'm sorry, 1 Samuel, no, 2 Samuel 6, the Lord gave David victory wherever he went. 2 Samuel 7, 2 Samuel 8. And these enemies became subject to David. It wasn't until 2 Samuel 11 that David runs into trouble. Verse 47, the Lord lives. Praise be to my rock. Exalted be my God, the rock, my Savior. He's the God who avenges me, who puts nations underneath me, who sets me free from my enemies. You exalted me above my foes. From a violent man, you rescued me. It's probably talking about King Saul. Therefore, I will praise you, O God, among the nations. I will sing the praises of your name. That's verse 50. The Apostle Paul quotes that in the New Testament, in the book of Romans, speaking about God's plan to bring Israel, to graft them back into the olive tree. Let's see if I could find that. Romans chapter... 15, I'm sorry, probably not that far. Oops, it looks like I'm going to have to look it up later. But Paul does quote that passage because of its reference to the Gentiles. That among the Gentiles I will sing your name. It's God's plan for Jew and Gentile to be brought into the kingdom. And in 2 Samuel 22, the last verse, he gives his king great victories. He shows unfailing kindness to his anointed, to David and his descendants. 
forever. You know, so what a beautiful, beautiful passage that is spoken by David in 2 Samuel 22. So don't wait until the last minute to pray. Pray to God every single day. Have a relationship with God. Don't make God your 911. Make God your 24 7. Follow Him. Give your life to the one who gave his life for you on the cross and rose again. Jesus loves you. This I know, for the Bible tells me so. God bless you. Have a great day. We'll be back tomorrow.